It's a pleasure and a privilege to be back at the Warburg Institute exactly 50 years after I arrived as a, as a graduate student. I vividly remember the first time I walked uh, into the reading room and I looked up and saw that astonishing uh, quote, quote, over the entranceway, otiosis locus hic non est discede morator. Thoughts of expulsion flashed through my mind. However, upon discovering that this quotation was a bit of graffiti written on the walls of an inn in, in ancient Pompeii that had a reputation for selling particularly delicious wine, I became a little bit less agitated at least to some extent. As I learned at the Warburg, the early modern period was one of transition, when people were drawn to the past, to the idea of the Golden Age and the Garden of Eden, but also to the future, envisaging all kinds of marvels, from submarines and flying machines to running water, frozen chickens, blood transfusions, and heated bedrooms with ensuite bathrooms. It is with this Janus-faced vision in mind that I look back to my good fortune to have been a graduate student here when Ernst Gombrich was the head of the institute and Francis Yates and D.P. Walker uh, became my uh, tutors or thesis advisors as we call them in the U.S. Remembering my years as a graduate student when I learned to write ambidextrously so I could sit on and warm one hand in the frigid reading room, and thinking back to the lunchroom and all those frothy cappuccinos tasting of eggs because the nozzle of the cappuccino machine steamed milk and scrambled eggs, <laughs> takes me back to what I now consider my past perfect. There was Frances Yates taking nail scissors out of her ample purse to cut through the impossibly thick plastic trapping the little piece of cheese that came with the crackers for lunch. There was Professor Gombrich and other members of the faculty with their guests all sitting at the same low tea tables with students around them in one of the most democratic and terrifying environments a crass student from America could possibly imagine. People, by which I mean adult academics, actually paused to think before they spoke. And they spoke about things of which I knew nothing, such as Hermeticism and Hermes Trismegistus, the art of Raymond Lull, and the idea that Francis Bacon was in reality a Renaissance magus and not the father of modern science that I had learned at Vassar College. My topic today is cannibalism, but not as actually practiced. My interest is rather in the way Europeans thought about cannibals from about the 16th century to the mid-18th century. Now, images of cannibals have obsessed the Western imagination, from uh, depictions of Saturn eating his children to the child-eating witch of nursery stories, from the Christian depiction of the devil as a cannibalistic, defecating monster, to Freud's conviction that civilization began when a band of brothers ate dear old dad Cannibals have been etched in Western psyches, but new kinds of cannibals and new forms of cannibalism appeared in, the, in early modern Europe, especially suited to the profound changes in mental and material life that accompanied the discovery of the new world, the religious conflicts generated by the Reformation, and the emergence of a capitalist consumer society. Here the cannibal becomes a protean figure on the one hand, he represents the primitive other, a savage member of a regressive society. And on the other hand, he represents uh, Europeans as they are engaging in a more capitalist enterprise society. Uh, and furthermore, on a subconscious level that gradually emerged into the consciousness of at least some people, the New World cannibals were mere pussycats sometimes noble pussycats, in comparison to a newer and more vicious kind of cannibal, those rapacious colonialists, imperialists, and capitalists who literally devoured the people who stood in their way. Christianity and Christian conflict 
further complicated the complex meaning of cannibalism in the early modern period. Religious fanatics on both sides of the religious divide were likened to cannibals as they tortured, mutilated, and murdered their religious enemies. The French Huguenot Jean de Lery claimed that the, lives, that the livers and hearts of the Protestants slain on St. Bartholomew's Day were eaten by Catholic killers. Well, the Catholic author of the theater of cruelty of our modern heretics advised readers to harden their hearts before they looked at images of Protestants dismembering little Catholic babies and force, forcing a priest to eat his own roasted genitals. The parallels between Christian communion and cannibal feast was relentlessly stressed by Protestants who used the analogy to ridicule the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. For all these reasons, cannibals and cannibalism became a topic of great interest and concern during the early modern period. The issue of cannibalism became involved in debates about what characterized human nature as well as the state of nature, not to mention the nature of the state. Were humans innately violent and the state of nature are inevitable lot, as Robert Burton maintained when he described the outside world as a market in which we maul, persecute, and study how to sting, gall, and vex one another, preying upon and devouring as so many ravenous birds? Or were humans basically good and their fall into society the cause of their moral turpitude, as Rousseau and others argued? And what about governments? Did they save us from our own cannibalistic tendencies, as Hobbes believed? Or were governments themselves cannibals par excellence who devoured their citizens in their quest for power and domination? At the heart of these questions lay a more fundamental one about what actually constituted the individual self, both in this world and the next world. Given the richness and complexity of the idea of cannibalism, I think we may agree that the cannibal is one of the great forgotten figures of philosophy, and nowhere are cannibals more uh, conspicuous than in the early modern period, when their present cast a long shadow on the birth of the modern world with its newly emerging ideas about the nation, the nature, of religion and the effects of a capitalist economy. And last but not least, the concept of the individual self. Now, although the theme of cannibalism is an ancient one, the subject did not come into its own until the publication of William Aarons's The Man-Eating Myth in 1979. <laughs> Arguing that the idea of savage cannibalism had little basis in reality, and was, in fact, simply a way for Westerners to demonize non-Westerners in order to justify colonialism, conquest, and even extermination, Aarons's book caused a furor. While he conceded that some form of cannibalism may actually have existed, he insisted that, for the most part, the myth was nothing short of a tool of empire, be it in the real world, or in the world of academia and the dis discipline of anthropology. Aarons's thesis was excoriated by Marshall Salins, among others, who equated his denial of cannibalism with the postmodern tendency to question the truth of anything, including the Holocaust. The stakes in the debate were obviously high, and since the publication of Aarons's book, much valuable work has been done to explain why the cannibal is the object of such a ver uh, veritable fixation and why the fantasy of cannibalism has been a psychic structure of long duration in the West from both a psychological and historical point of view. Now obviously the historical part of this analysis is the most germane to this talk, but before getting into that a word must be said about the undeniable fact that we all start off as cannibals, literally eating our mothers and trying to ingest the world as well. As we learn from Greek mythology, however, this is not a one-way street. Infanticide and cannibalism appear to be patriarchal 
prerogatives at the very heart of the establishment of the divine pantheon described in Hesiod's Theogony, as Saturn eats his children and the uh, Titans eat Dionysus. Freud took the argument many steps further in Totem and Taboo when he argued that the ritual murder of the father and the eating of his flesh uh, by the sons created the guilt that sublimated the violence upon which civilization was built. For Freud, individuals recapitulated this originary act of cannibalism in a figurative rather than a literal way as humans progress from the oral to the anal and finally to the genital stage. Uh, but even, uh, but no stage was completely left behind. Even a satisfactory attainment of the genital stage involved an unsuccessful attempt to recreate the absolute intimacy between mother and baby, a shadow of which is captured in the language of love, which is literally stuffed with metaphors of eating and devouring the loved one, who, among other things, is a sweetie pie who is good enough to eat. Consuming, consumption, and consummation are all as applicable to sex as they are to eating. But even the most intense and passionate love fails to reestablish the complex unity that existed between mother and baby. Consequently, in some places, the thwarted desire for unity manifests itself in an adult's aggressive attempt to consume the other. As many scholars have pointed out, during the 17th and 18th century, curiosity is removed from the catalog of vices and legitimated as a, as a suitable response to the avalanche of news coming into Europe from previously unknown parts of the world. Unlike many of his more conservative contemporaries, Francis Bacon enthusiastically embraced the extension of intellectual boundaries that came with this new information. The sentence from the book of Daniel, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased, appealed to Bacon, who used it as a motto uh, for his Novum Organum, uh, which he illustrated with a ship sailing suggestively through the pillars of Hercules and thus symbolically surpassing the ancients in their quest for knowledge. In widening the intellectual boundaries, uh, welcomed by Bacon, I, sorry, the widening of intellectual boundaries welcomed by Bacon was not, however, positively construed by everyone, as we can see, uh, and we can see this reluctance in discussions about alleged cannibals. The scholar of religion, J.Z. Smith, has emphasized the importance of place in both a culture's and an individual's self-perception since social change is inseparable from symbolic change, the question people ask and need to answer to ensure a stable ex existence is where do I stand? These were precisely the questions that preoccupied and in many cases terrified individuals in the early modern world as they cleared away the detritus of outmoded symbolic structures and struggled to build new ones suitable for a changing world. Smith emphasizes how difficult this is because to change stance is to totally alter one's symbols and to inhabit a different world. What caused individuals to change their stand on many key issues was the increasing incoherence in the symbolic systems governing contemporary culture. What thinking Europeans were forced to confront in the early modern period was the breakdown of previously established boundaries both in the heavens and on earth and between heaven and earth as the Aristotelian Ptolemaic world where the earth was at the center and everything had its appointed place and was linked to every other thing in a series of correspondences gave way to the Copernican universe. Once the earth was recognized as a planet like every other, where was heaven and how was it to be distinguished from earth? With the voyages of discovery and settlements in the Americas, what had previously been considered uh, the dangerous, unfathomable margins of the known world inhabited by monstrous peoples and beasts uh, was absorbed into the cultural center, but not without considerable confusion and much opposition. Establishing borders and boundaries 
has been a fundamental aspect of human society from the beginning of recorded history, and obviously a necessary one, for without difference there can be no meaning. So thinking in terms of dichotomy such as nature, culture, public, private, spirit, flesh, male, female, is a basic aspect of human thought. Derrida claimed that these various binary oppositions can be subsumed under a single one, that of inside-outside. But this opposition is itself always in danger of collapsing because what appears to be on the outside of any given system of thought is really fully on the inside. For this very reason, the most interesting binary opposition for this talk is inside-outside, since cannibalism involves eating, and the act of eating is the most basic model for the dissolution of boundaries and the incorporation of foreign elements into an individual group or society. Eating is therefore potentially dangerous, and food a potent symbol for whatever is absorbed from outside, whether physically or mentally, literally or metaphorically. Food is therefore more than a substance, it's an attitude, a circumstance, even a language. We hunger and thirst after God. We also hunger and thirst after knowledge, truth, and righteousness. And in so doing, we may read voraciously, bite off more than we can chew, swallow a story whole, ruminate over an issue, digest an argument, assimilate a source, and emerge with half-baked ideas or much mental nourishment and food for thought. Something may look to you good enough to eat, while others might dismiss it as indigestible. Consequently, individuals have or do not have good taste. Food is not just good to eat, but good to think. We must go further and say that to eat or not to eat, eat is the real existential question. And most societies are therefore careful to determine not only with whom one eats and how one eats, but what one eats. While maintaining the integrity and purity of individual bodies was an important aspect of medieval and early modern life, maintaining the boundaries of the body politic or the body of Christendom was equally important. Mary Douglas has shown that the Jewish dietary laws did not affect individuals alone. The same substances that were prohibited entry into an individual's body were also prohibited from entering the precincts of the temple as well as the borders of Israel. In the early modern period, Europeans were deeply concerned with establishing and maintaining borders. The fear that these borders had been penetrated and the body politic infiltrated and poisoned by sinister external forces provided the foundation for the attacks on Jews, heretics, and witches. A key characteristic of these threatening external forces was their alleged cannibalism. The concern with purging heretics and pagans from the body of Christendom intensified at the same time that the real meaning of the central Catholic Christian rite uh, of the Eucharist meal as it was being debated. Uh, from the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 on, the doctrine of transubstantiation, in which the wafer and wine literally became the body and blood of Christ, exactly when the priest said the uh, proper uh, words, for this is my body, this is my blood. This became central in the development of Catholic theology and the institution of the priesthood. Eucharist miracles began to proliferate beginning, uh, becoming the subject of visions, sermons, and paintings. Early in the 15th century, Colette of Corby, for example, had a vision of Jesus in a chafing dish carved up into fragments of bloodied meat. God informed her uh, that humans, uh, human sin was responsible for Jesus' cruel dismemberment. Uh, Kaiser of Heisenbach uh, stressed the beneficial effect such miracles had in inculcating the reality of transubstantiation uh, in the minds of the faithful. As of today, uh, there are more than 150 church-approved Eucharist miracles, such as the one illustrated here, which shows the bloodied and hence 
transubstantiated wafer uh, ensconced in an ornate reliquary. Leaving aside the subject of trans, uh, transubstantiation, the fact is that most Europeans, whether Catholic or Protestant, practiced cannibalism on a routine basis. Medical vampirism, vampirism was a fact of early modern life. The medieval properties, and, and uh, the, sorry, the medicinal properties of blood were universally recognized. According to the Roman physician Celsus, warm blood from wounded, glad wounded gladiators or executed criminals cured epilepsy. Many Christians were convinced the Jews required blood, the blood of young Christians to heal their innumerable infirmities. The great Renaissance philosopher, Marsilio Ficino, was convinced that old men could be rejuvenated by sucking blood directly from the vein of a healthy youth. In Protestant areas of Germany, uh, the blood of those beheaded was sold and sometimes drunk on the spot by epileptics and other invalids. At the execution of Louis XVI, people dipped their handkerchiefs, rags, and even a pair of dice in the royal blood to absorb the curative properties. A special kind of fungus known as moss of the skull, called usnia, was also highly regarded. It grew on the heads of dead or executed cadavers and was, I don't think you can execute a cadaver, so I'm sorry about that, <laughs> um, and was uh, used to stop hemorrhaging. Charles II was devoted to what he called the spirit of the skull, and he paid 6,000 pounds for a recipe, a pretty hefty sum in the 17th century. The king prepared the medicine frequently himself in his private laboratory. It was the first thing he asked for when he woke up feeling ghastly four days before he died. <laughs> Robert Boyle recognized how hypocritical it was for Europeans to condemn cannibals when they themselves were cannibals. As he says, we condemn cannibals, but we give infants mother's milk, which is but blanched blood. We use mummy in medicines, and we drink our own boy's urine to prevent scurvy and the gout. None of these pertinent observations did much to lessen the dichotomy that the majority of Europeans saw between themselves and the New World's cannibals. However much Europeans may have wanted to discover what was real about the natives and cultures they encountered in their expeditions to the New World, uh, access to such reality was inevitably mediated through preconceived notions drawn from Herodotus, Pliny, Marco Polo, and a host of other ancient and medieval and early modern commentators as to what lay beyond the known world. All this information was then filtered through Christian stories of the fall and redemption. Until the 18th century, it was the rare European, like Montaigne, who could truly entertain the idea of the noble savage. The superiority of the European us versus the cannibal them reasserted itself whenever challenged in any substantial way leading to a reaffirmation of the superior beauty, intelligence, and morality of the Europeans in contrast to the mental inferiority, immorality, and ugliness of the natives. It should therefore come as no surprise that the iconic image of Vespucci discovering America uh, uh, has Vespucci fully clothed and armored uh, as he encounters a naked America. She rises from her hammock as if being awakened from uh, some kind of primitive torpor. In this illustration, America is surrounded by exotic flora and fauna, and among the flora are cannibals who appear in the background at the exact center of the picture. There one sees a group of cannibal women tending a barbecue of dismembered human limbs. <laughs> the fact that the, brave, uh, that the New World was named after the Old World explorer Vespucci, Am Amerigo Vespucci, implies that prior to his arrival, America had no past or future. 
This is indeed the writing that conquers, as Michel Certeau claims. For to name something is to establish its identity, and Europeans were the ones who most successfully did this. Europeans considered the New World virgin territory, uh, and like any virgin, she needed a man to make her fertile and useful. It was normal for Europeans, uh, colonists and, and discoverers and imperialists, to identify land with female bodies and colonization with sexual mastery. And this goes right up to modern period. Uh, thus, when Europeans wrote about the New World and the people inhabiting it, and when European artists illustrated these narratives, what both writers and artists were depicting had more to do and say about themselves than the people and places they encountered. This is especially the case uh, in the multi-volume series of nar narratives and engravings published by Theodore de Brie and members of de Brie and members of his family between 1590 and 1634 and known under the rubric of the Great Voyages. The de Brie narratives and their accompanying illustrations do not show us the real natives of the Indies uh, or uh, sorry the real nature of Indian life or the real look of the physical beings who live that life but a European interpretation of both in the light of European interests and concerns. Cannibalism was one of the primary filters through which these concerns were mediated. The debris volumes further reflect the family's Protestant bias and the emotional, financial, and political interests of, the, of Protestants as they struggled with the Spanish for dominion in the Americas. This bias explains the changing character of the depiction of the Ameri American Indians as one moves from the first volumes to the later ones. In the first volumes, uh, the relationship between the English settlers uh, and the Algonquin Indians of Virginia is idealized, as is the relationship between the French Huguenot colonists and the Indians of Florida. These Indians are romanticized and depicted in the classical mode. The third volume is devoted to the cannibals of Brazil, the famous Tupinamba. The depiction of the Indians here is more aggressive, bloody, and savage, but with the mitigating factor that these values deal with the Spanish incursions into the Americas. What we find in these volumes is the indictment by Protestants of the tyranny of Spanish Catholicism and the devilish cruelty of the Spanish, which by implication makes fruitful cooperation with the natives impossible. By stressing the enslavement of the natives and the horrible tortures inflicted on them by their Catholic enslavers, the debris illustrations, even more than the texts themselves, contributed to the spread of the famous black legend excoriating the Spanish conquistadors. Here the Spanish are depicted as the real cannibals, and whatever awful things the natives may have done is largely explained as a reaction against the unspeakable cruelty of their tormentors. We know from La Casas and others that the Spanish engaged in horrendous acts of violence um, in which they tortured and, and brutalized um, and did various horrible things to uh, the Indians, and we could see this with the killing, uh, throwing the sodomites to, the, uh, you know, dogs and various other things. Um, but of course, this is a very one-sided position. Um, it's not that the Indians are given a complete free pass by debris, even in the illustrations to um, the, the first volumes. Uh, which condemn the Spanish. The Indians are presented as dangerous and, and unpredictable. But once again, what is especially interesting is the way this otherness is communicated through motifs and themes that are already familiar to Europeans from their own history of violence and cruelty. One particular motif that will re resonate with anyone who has studied the European witch hunts is uh, in the 16th and 17th century, is the woman with sagging breasts. You can see her up at the top. Um, not only do her pendulous breasts connect her to the long-established iconography of the European witch, 
But so, of course, does her age, her wrinkles, her wispy hair, her brutish look, and her cannibalistic instincts. As you can see from the following image, uh, the European witch was the cannibal par excellence. She kidnapped, tortured, cooked and ate dismembered infants, relished the grilled penises of bewitched and glamorized males, which you can see in sort of the left bottom there, um, hot dogs over a tree branch. Um, and and uh, found her stews and brews of simmered body parts just as finger licking good as her Indian <laughs> as her Indian counterparts. Can you do the next one? Good. Um, female cannibals in the Americas love precisely the same thing. Like witches, they were said to love blood and fat. Uh, and as one can see in the illustrations, they lick their fingers greedily to get the very last drop of both. The active and aggressive role that witches played in the old world and cannibal women in the new world represented the antithesis of European norms of political authority and gender relationships, another indication of how Europeans could and often did experience new experiences through very old lenses. An even more frightening image of a woman with long pendulous breasts appears in the frontispiece of the 13th volume uh, of the Debris um, Voyages. Um, here we see, next one, uh, a, a monstrous couple with uh, amazingly large sexual organs. The woman's long pendulous breasts hang below her waist, their length extended by the long nipples like the teats of a cow. Her male counterpart wears a penis sheath. Both have uh, sharpened finger, finger and toenails like animal claws. From their cheeks, ears, nostrils, and chin hang mice and frogs who further uh, enhance their grotesque and brutish appearance. A further uh, indication of how profoundly Europeans' uh, depictions of cannibals reflected their own psyches and cultural concerns comes in this depiction of pagan idols. Uh, an engraving of these idols, which you see over here on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, is not hard to read in terms of uh, Christian symbolism. We see uh, the same sort of uh, characteristics given to the Christian devil, uh, horns, a grotesque face on the torso or backside, uh, and a serpentine tail. The catastrophic religious and political warfare endemic in 16th and 17th century Europe led to a debate about the nature of man and the state of nature, as I mentioned before. In this atmosphere, the cannibal emerged as the most potent symbol of the chaos caused by the breakdown of authority and hierarchical relationships. Commenting on the need for government, uh, Hugo Grotius declared, and I quote, if there were no sovereign power, we should swallow up one another alive. Where the, uh, with the values of hindsight and in the face of the continuing struggles over religion, on the continent and in England, Robert Bolton warned his parishioners of the dangers of anarchy. Take sovereignty from the face of the earth and you turn it into a cockpit. Men would become cutthroats and cannibal uh, one to another. Without sovereignty and social hierarchy, men would be thrown into a state of nature of the kind made all too uh, familiar. Uh, by the wars of religion. So in the 16th and 17th century, we have so many wars of religion. Uh, and in the minds of contemporaries like Hobbes, this really was very important. Um, it was very important to have, have governments because only governments could stop this. And I would suggest that for many of Hobbes' contemporaries, his notion that let life was nasty, brutish, and short, really mirrored their own experiences. But even legitimate government authority 
which many did consider the only possible bulwark against lawless anarchy, began to raise alarms. Jean Baudin in the 16th century excoriated the tyrant as he who drinketh the blood of his uh, uh, people and gnaweth their bones, and out of them also sucketh every bit of marrow. The supposed government, uh, the support governments gave uh, to a nation's military ambition led Baron Dolbach to describe the leaders of the the leaders of European nations as the true Caribs or true cannibals because of the ease with which they sacrificed their citizens. Even Immanuel Kant um, logged in in this debate and considered uh, governments potential cannibals. Now the emergence of capitalism and commercial uh, and commercial conquest that, and the commercial conquest that followed on the heels of exploration and colonialization was no less cannibalistic in its effects according to European critics of both. Homo economicus was not a pretty sight for some people, nor was it cannibal capitalism. As Montaigne uh, wrote in his essay of carriages, who ever set the unit utility of commerce and trading at such a price so many cities raised, so many nations exterminated, so many millions of people put to the sword, and the richest and most beautiful part of the world turned upside down for the traffic of pearls and pepper. A century and a half later, Jonathan Swift uh, is even fiercer in his denunciation of the rapacity of European colonizers. The natives are driven out or destroyed, their princes tortured to discover the, their gold, a free license given to all acts of inhumanity and lust, the earth reeking with the blood of the inhabitants, and this execrable crew of butchers employed in so pious an expedition is a modern colony sent to convert and civilize an idolatrous and barbarous people. Europeans tended to see the historical antecedents of cannibalistic capitalists in the stereotype of Jewish merchants and moneylenders who obviously appeared in Marlowe and Shakespeare and anti-Semitic literature across Europe. But what really began the march towards cannibal capitalism was not Jewish money lending, but the emergence of possessive individualism or the theory that an individual was the proprietor of his own person, free from dependence on others and owing little or nothing to society. This theory provided the foundation for emerging capitalist and consumer society, and this represented and represented this new kind of individual, and no one represented this new kind of individualistic uh, behavior better than Robinson Crusoe. Ian Watt was the first to see Daniel Defoe's novel as something of a, of a capitalist manifesto. But he also claimed that the book was a deeply religious fable of Puritan spiritual life. Now, more recent commentators have been less kind to both the book and to Crusoe. They've emphasized what Watt overlooked, namely the way the theme of cannibalism structures the story and reveals Crusoe's state of mind. From the moment Crusoe sees the footprint on the sand, he spends every night in expectation of, quote, being murdered and devoured before morning. When he returns to the beach and finds the skulls, hands, feet, and other bones of human bodies, uh, in chapter 15, the sort of remnants of a cannibalistic feet, feast, he's completely overwhelmed and he rushes off to one of his hiding places and frantically builds an enormous wall to protect himself. This is very odd behavior indeed for a man described by earlier commentators as the prototype of the new economic man, that model of uh, healthy self-sufficiency and ra the rational calculator of his own self-interest. In a psychoanalytic study of Crusoe, Elihu Perlman 
points out that Crusoe had plenty of places to hide on his island. So both his fantasies about the dangers the cannibals presented and his eventual murder of them were unnecessary. While cannibalism and violence are major themes in the story, Perlman comments on the absence of sex, passion, and romance of any kind and sees this as a sign of Crusoe's immaturity and persistent childish, childishness or whatever. Um, like an infant, Crusoe fears that the cannibals threaten to engulf and absorb him and devour him, but he wants to do exactly the same thing to them and to the world at large. What, Perlman asks, does it tell us that Robinson Crusoe is the most popular novel in English? Perlman's discussion of Crusoe brings us to one of the major issues that comes up in connection with cannibalism, and that is the issue of exactly, as I said before, what constitutes the self, both while living, but especially after death. Since most Christians at the time in the early modern uh, Europe accepted the idea of bodily resurrection, how could the bodies of cannibalized individuals be resurrected and attain eternal life? Augustine raises the case of a starving man who eats another. In what body will the man who has been eaten be resurrected? Will his flesh be restored? If it is, won't that leave holes in the body of the cannibal? And what about Christian martyrs fed to the lions? Numerous attempts were made to solve the conundrums cannibalism pos posed for the idea of bodily resurrection. Some argued that cannibals cannot assimilate body, body, body parts or that they can only assimilate non-essential parts. <laughs> Others claimed that what, whenever humans ate a natural food, uh, they were naturally struck with nausea. Still others, like Augustine, believed that the flesh the cannibal absorbed would be returned to its rightful owner at the day of resurrection, and whatever gaps and holes were left in the body uh, of the cannibal would be filled in by God. Lions <clears throat> would, as we see in this mosaic, regurgitate the limbs of the martyrs they had eaten. Such answers appeared uh, less and less convincing in the early modern period, as the early modern period went on. Uh, and so, consequently, there were fewer and fewer, well, still quite a lot, but fewer people began to, uh, fewer people continued to believe in the idea of full bodily resurrection. So libertines and skeptics loved to exploit this kind of conundrum, the kind of conundrum presented clearly by cannibalism, especially in regard to the idea of resurrection. And we have seen how entwined the issue of cannibalism was with the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist. The illustration of transubstantiation by Hogarth presents a clear idea of what at least one English Protestant thought about this central Protestant, I mean Catholic doctrine. The Scottish Protestant David Hume also enjoyed tackling the problem of transubstantiation from the angle of cannibalism. In his Natural History of Religion, a priest asks a Turk after he is converted to Christianity and received the sacrament, how many gods are there? The Turk replies, none at all. You have told me all along that there is but one God, and yesterday I ate him. <laughs> what better place to end a talk about cannibalism, cannibalism in the minds and imaginations of early modern Europeans? Thank you. I'd be happy to answer.